Hello, my name is Gregory Ma, and I am a clinical pharmacy specialist in critical care at Vancouver General Hospital. Welcome to the special series organized by the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists, BC branch, on COVID-19, what pharmacists know now. Today, I will highlight the role of hydroxychloroquine in the management of COVID-19. Here are my disclosures. I'd like to note that the information presented is up to date as of March 23rd, and that both published and unpublished research in COVID-19 continues to emerge on a daily basis. Additionally, information in this presentation reflects my own current views and opinions, and are not the official position of the CSHP BC branch. I will begin this presentation by highlighting hydroxychloroquine structure and its proposed mechanism of antiviral activity. I will provide what is currently known uh, based on in vitro and human studies of hydroxychloroquine and COVID-19. I will provide some safety and other clinical considerations for its use and end by providing current recommendations for its clinical use in COVID-19. Now on March 19th, President Trump announced at a press conference that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are very powerful and game changers, in fact, in the fight against COVID-19. In the day subsequent to that, major pharmaceutical manufacturers such as Sanofi, Novartis, Bayer, and Apotex pledged to donate millions of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine tablets for research and treatment. Now, since then, there have been individual reports of miraculous recovery after one or two days of therapy, but unfortunately, there have also been cases of unintentional overdoses of chloroquine in the community um, from people who wanted to either prevent or treat COVID-19. In terms of drug availability in BC, to the best of my knowledge, chloroquine is not available for order from our major wholesaler for a number of months now. And recently, hydroxychloroquine has gone on back order due to strong global demand um, from our major wholesaler. Now, the chemical structure of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are largely similar. The only real difference, as the name implies, is that hydroxychloroquine has a hydroxylated ethyl side chain. In terms of the proposed mechanism of antiviral activity for chloroquine, um, the SARS coronavirus 2 um, is believed to attack pneumocytes um, and gain entry through the ACE2 receptor. Now, chloroquine interferes with ACE2 receptor glycosylation and thus it prevents the coronavirus from binding to its target, the ACE2 receptor, via its spike S protein, and thus prevents the virus from gaining entry into the cell. Another mechanism for chloroquine is that when the virus enters, it's initially incorporated into an endosome, which converts into a lysosome, and where viral genetic material is subsequently um, extracted into the intracellular cytosol. Chloroquine is believed to increase the pH of these endosomes and lysosomes um, and thus affects the intracellular viral trafficking of coronavirus. And lastly, because drugs like hydroxychloroquine are immunomodulatory in nature, it is thought that these drugs can have effects on repressing antigen-presenting cells on inhibiting T cell activation and ultimately minimizing uh, cytokine release, which would be otherwise present in severe manifestations of COVID-19. Now, in terms of in vitro data, before going into specific studies, it is important for me to highlight the concept of the 50% effective concentration, often abbreviated the EC50. Now, the EC50 is a measure of drug potency. It is defined as the molar concentration of a drug that produces a 50% response of the maximum possible response for that drug. So, a lower EC50 indicates a more potent drug and uh, one that is a therapeutic option. 
when plotted on a graph, um, looking on the right-hand side, we have chloroquine, and this study in particular noted an EC50 of 1.13. A more recent in vitro study was published um, in Clinical Infectious Diseases by Yao and colleagues on March the 9th, and it looked at SARS coronavirus 2 infected viral cells as well. But this time, they looked at various concentrations of hydroxychloroquine, and they used chloroquine, 500 milligrams twice daily, as their reference. They also looked at hydroxychloroquine's population pharmacokinetic data from various studies, and they did some modeling uh, of PKPD parameters. In terms of chloroquine, they found an EC50 of 5.47 micromolar. And for hydroxychloroquine, it was found to be more potent with an EC50 of 0.72 micromolar. So the study authors concluded that hydroxychloroquine displayed better PKPD characteristics than chloroquine, that hydroxychloroquine decreased viral replication in a concentration-dependent manner, and based on population PK uh, data with hydroxychloroquine and looking at the EC50 derived in this study, that a suggested dosing um, that would achieve reasonable concentrations um, would be hydroxychloroquine 400 milligrams twice a day for one day, then 200 milligrams twice a day for four days, and that when this regimen is administered, that it would maintain trough concentrations above the EC50 for at least 10 days, given the fact that the half-life of hydroxychloroquine is about 40 days. Now that is what we know from in vitro studies. The translation from in vitro studies to human studies, in my opinion, um, has not been too impressive. Now the first uh, published clinical evidence in humans was done on February 19th by Gao and colleagues in a relatively obscure journal. And it was actually just a letter to the journal. Um, and they wrote that in 10 hospitals in China thus far, they have looked at 100 patients who have demonstrated that chloroquine is superior to control treatment in inhibiting the exacerbation of pneumonia, improving lung imaging findings, promoting virus negative seroconversion, conversion, and shortening the disease course. Uh, however, no actual clinical data was provided, um, and I have emailed the specific author, and I have unfortunately not yet had a response in terms of obtaining clinical trial data. This study has been quoted in numerous Chinese and non-Chinese articles as the reason for using chloroquine, um, which is unfortunate because we don't have any clinical data to support their statements. More recently, on March 20th, a French non-randomized, non-blinded observational study was published in the, in the International Journal of Antimicrobial Agents. And what they did was that they looked at hospitalized patients who tested positive for COVID-19 and were at least 12 years of age. And keep in mind, this was not randomized. So they offered hydroxychloroquine 200 milligrams three times a day for 10 days um, to patients. Uh, and clinicians had the option of adding azithromycin. For patients who either refused hydroxychloroquine or for patients who were treated at another French center, they received usual care. And the authors of the study compared, on a primary outcome, the viral clearance of coronavirus at day six. They also reported to look at secondary outcomes, such as temperature, respirate, uh, hospital length of stay, mortality. However, they didn't actually report on these secondary outcomes in their uh, published manuscript. Now, in general, the study had patients who were enrolled um, from a time of symptom onset to trial or study enrollment of anywhere between 0 to 10 days. In the hydroxychloroquine group, uh, 26 patients were enrolled. However, six were lost to follow-up either due to transfer to ICU, discharging home, or death. Two patients in this group were asymptomatic, and six patients received azithromycin based on clinician preference. In the control group, four patients were asymptomatic. 
For their primary outcome, looking at day 6 negative viral PCRs, keep in mind that in the hydroxychloroquine group, 6 patients were lost to follow-up. 14 out of 20 patients demonstrated viral clearance at day 6, compared to control where 2 out of 16 patients demonstrated viral clearance. Uh, and this was reported to be statistically significant. Also note, the trial um, reported that all six patients who received hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin demonstrated viral clearance at six days. Now, while the results at first glance seem positive and has generated some degree of um, internet attention, uh, it is important to note that there are a lot of biases with a study designed in this way. Uh, with a non-randomized, non-blinded nature, it introduces selection, performance, detection, and attrition bias. Um, it's also important to look at how they recruited patients. So many of the patients who came into the study were actually asymptomatic when they presented to the hospital. And we don't typically treat um, patients with viral disease uh, who are asymptomatic in the first place. A significant proportion of patients in the hydroxychloroquine group were lost to follow-up, as I've mentioned. This study did not um, report or study the additive toxicities of giving hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin together, um, things such as QT prolongation. Um, in the control group, uh, viral PCRs were not done in 5 out of 16 patients on day 6, so it's hard to understand um, how they can assess two arms when you don't have a, um, any data on the primary outcome date. Patients entered into the study anywhere between 0 to 10 days of symptom onset, so whether patients benefited from getting enrolled early in their symptom course or relatively late in their symptom course is relatively unclear. The baseline comparisons for both groups only really reported age and gender, so no comorbidities were presented. And um, perhaps most importantly, no clinical outcomes data was reported with this study. So in my opinion, um, this study was severely methodologically flawed. Uh, they had poor outcomes definition and assessments. It was a relatively heterogeneous patient population, noting that some patients were completely asymptomatic. Um, and in my opinion, there are no clinically meaningful conclusions that can be drawn from this study. And unfortunately, that's the only clinical evidence that we have to date in humans for using hydroxychloroquine in COVID-19. So clinicians might be tempted to ask ourselves, so what are the downsides with using hydroxychloroquine? It's been used in rheumatoid arthritis for decades now. We have a reasonable base of um, clinical experience that it is relatively relatively well tolerated, uh, even with years of use. And, and to a large extent, I would agree. Um, there's been a Cochrane review published in rheumatoid arthritis looking at 400 milligrams a day um, in about 600 patients in total. And in general, yeah, there are no uh, differences in terms of withdrawals from the study due to toxicity. When looking at individual studies, um, generally there are about 120 patients each in rheumatoid arthritis looking at 400 milligrams a day. There are not signals of severe harm or toxicities associated with hydroxychloroquine use. Largely, they are uh, gastrointestinal in nature or the occasional dermatological mild side effect that is more, reported more than placebo um, and headache, but largely uh, adverse effects that I feel clinicians would be willing to accept. And lastly, for a um, a survey of 3,000 patients with lupus, 50% uh, reported side effects, and most of them were gastrointestinal nature. However, it is important to note that there are other reported toxicities that are perhaps more severe um, that happen rarely but are reported. So things such as QT prolongation, cardiomyopathy, and hypoglycemia need to be monitored if hydroxychloroquine is considered, and also issues with bone marrow suppression and skin reactions. Now, one common toxicity that is reported in literature with particularly prolonged years of use is retinal toxicity, but I wouldn't expect this to be an issue with short courses if it is used for COVID-19. But more importantly, it is important to note that we don't have a good solid clinical evidence base for hydroxychloroquine. 
Um, and it's important to note that without proper RCTs, the benefits versus harms largely remain unknown. Um, and that if we as clinicians start using investigational therapies without proper uh, monitoring and outside of a clinical trial, that we would be using um, these agents inconsistently, uh, even among specialists, and that would easily lead to confusion amongst healthcare staff and the public. And it's also important to note that a drug like hydroxychloroquine is currently on um, back order due to strong global demand. And because pharmaceutical supplies are limited, especially in settings of pandemics, uh, we have to reserve drug for who we think would benefit, and we'll only know that by doing an RCT. And in the meantime, by if we do use a lot of hydroxychloroquine uh, globally, we are limiting access to this medication um, from patients who have established indications, such as rheumatoid arthritis. So what did the guidelines um, suggest for using investigational agents such as hydroxychloroquine? The World Health Organization published on March 13th that there is no current evidence to recommend any specific anti-COVID-19 therapy uh, for patients with uh, confirmed COVID-19. The CDC published on March 21st that there is currently no available data from RCTs to inform clinical guidance on the use, dosing, and duration of hydroxychloroquine for prophylaxis or treatment of SARS coronavirus 2 infections. And they go on to mention that anecdotally, U.S. clinicians have used a variety of regimens um, off-label and outside of the context of RCTs. The Society of Critical Care Medicine, uh, through its Surviving Sepsis Campaign Authorship Group, published on March 20th that there is insufficient evidence to issue a recommendation on the use of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine in critically ill adults with COVID-19. And lastly, the Australia New Zealand group, um, which go by ANZICS, um, they state that there are no proven pharmaceutical treatments for COVID-19 other than supportive care, and that all experimental therapy should be provided in the setting of a clinical trial, um, and that specifically antiviral therapies are currently not recommended for routine use in acute respiratory failure with COVID-19. So most of the international and professional bodies are saying the same thing. Uh, and it's important to note, if we do a search on clinicaltrials.gov, that there are trials ongoing worldwide that uh, each individual institution can try to leverage off of and gain access. I can speak um, that BC currently has a trial that is in the midst of getting approved. It's called the CATCO study, and it is being arranged by an ID specialist from BC Children's Hospital. And currently it is looking at or planning to look at Kaletra versus hydroxychloroquine versus remdesivir versus standard of care. So in terms of my clinical bottom line as of today, uh, I would say that there is insufficient clinical evidence to recommend use of hydroxychloroquine for treatment or prevention of COVID-19. And I would caution clinicians to understand that there are risks with using immunomodulatory agents such as hydroxychloroquine that need to be considered uh, when using such an agent for the treatment of a viral disease. Uh, I would say that the use of hydroxychloroquine uh, for COVID-19 should be restricted to well-designed clinical trials where study populations, treatment courses, and outcomes are clearly defined. And because this is a field where evidence is published rapidly, uh, that as new clinical research data emerges, that treatment recommendations and clinical guidelines should reflect the strength and applicability of the available evidence. So that concludes um, this session on COVID-19, what pharmacists know now. I'd like to thank the CSHB BC branch for inviting, me to, for inviting me to speak on this series. And for everyone, I am happy to answer questions by email. And until then, uh, I hope that you all keep well and that you stay safe and thank you for your attention.